Did you get your sleep last night? Yeah. Uh, I'm glad you got some sleep. Been praying for you to get some extra rest. <laughs> Been working way too hard. It's good to see you this morning. Glad you're here. We're having an election coming up Tuesday, if nobody reminded you yet. Amen. That uh, we need to be on our toes and in our voting booths. So let's get out there, pray, make a difference, and do what we know is the biblical principle thing to do. So uh, we've talked plenty of that, sent plenty of emails out on that. So that's about all I'll say about it. Get out there and vote. Or I'm going to come beat you up. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. On Wednesday night, starting here through uh, November, December, there's a four-part sermon I'm going to be sharing on Ahab and Jezebel. Uh, it's an interesting study as we look at their character study in the Word of God, how God uh, wants what God wants to do with our life versus what Satan wants to do with our life, and how Satan can manipulate a man and a woman in ways that... Uh, they get so deceived they don't even see what's going on. So I want to encourage you to be here this Wednesday night and the next couple of Wednesday nights for this particular study. It's a very intriguing study and look in the, in the Word of God at these two particular characters, uh, which we know a lot about in Scripture, but uh, there's much, much more that can be said about it. All right? So we're going to look at those particular things. But today... I want to talk to you about a common subject that we don't always get to talk about, but most every one of us are very familiar with, and it's called disappointment. In fact, it says, if you can't read the total sign in the green, it says, Dis welcome to disappointment. Don't stay too long. Uh, there's a tendency to park at disappointment. We all have disappointments. There's always times that uh, we're expecting something, and it doesn't go our way. There's times when we uh, arrive at situations and we're completely blown away by what happened because our expectations were completely different. Now, this can go all the way from simple disappointments like just something not happening that we had an expectation happening in a, in a small event to, to something like, you know, you're, you thought you were going to play the game and the coach put you on the bench or you thought that uh, you were going to get the promotion at the job and somebody else got the promotion at the job. It could go all the way from there to the far extreme of disappointment, which usually leaves us in a place called grief to where we experience great loss in our lives, even to the loss of loved ones. And these disappointments fill our hearts and, and fill our, our, our minds so much so at different times. We just we get kind of crippled by it. And the Bible has a lot of situations where people face disappointments. Things didn't turn out the way they expected them to turn out. The unmet expectations and disappointment stirs up in our hearts and some emotion stirs within us. And uh, it can take us in a lot of the wrong paths, in the long, wrong directions, if we don't learn uh, how we should respond in these kind of situations. Uh, I'm sure no one here has ever been disappointed. Amen. And I'm sure that uh, probably, if we be honest, most of us experienced some disappointment in the last few days on some level, if not today. Amen. You, something where you had an expectation or something's going to go. And, uh, and I really believe that if we're not very cautious in how we handle this, we can sow some seeds in our life that leave, uh, go deep with their roots and bring up back and bring forth some bad fruits in our lives. So we can't let those things grow and, 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 and kind of simmer and brew in our heart and life. We need to learn how to deal with appointments and the, the disappointments that can happen in our marriage, can happen in personal relationships, happen in churches, on and on and on. We could go talking about these kind of things. And, but I'm going to trust that the Holy Spirit will apply this message to whatever uh, area your heart needs the most of it in. Uh, this is, we just finished a series of messages. This is not part of a series. It's just one word that, that was on my heart and a word that the Lord spoke to me uh, uh, in my own heart at different times in my life. And it's an interesting passage that we're going to read from in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 16. And in this chapter, God's dealing with the, the uh, prophet Samuel about anointing another king. You remember the story of perhaps of King Saul who's been an absolute disappointment to, to, to our Heavenly Father, a disappointment especially to Samuel. I believe as his, as his friend and prophet, he had a lot of expectations for King Saul. But you know, King Saul didn't work out the way he was supposed to. He was the king, the first king over Israel, when the people decided, we need a king. Everybody else has got a king, and that's the way people think. We don't have a king. We need a king like everybody else has got a king. So give us a king. We want a king too. I mean, they got a king. We need a king. Hey, the Amalekites have a king. The Chaldeans have a king. The Canaanites have a king. Everybody got a king but us. Amen? So we need a king too. And it wasn't time for the king yet, but though they, 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 God gave them this opportunity to have this king, and uh, Samuel goes out and anoints Saul to be the king. I mean, by the way, uh, if you read the description of him in Scripture, he's the best-looking guy in town. I mean, he's taller than everybody. He's probably more articulate, handsome, the Bible says, and, and at least a head taller than everybody in the nation. So he, he's a big dude, you know. He looks good. Uh, he fits the bill of what, this is what a king ought to be. This is what a king ought to look like. Let's make him the king. 
And so he's made the king, but he turns out to be a man of constant, continual uh, disappointment and disobedience to God. His obedience is always marked in measured senses. He doesn't completely obey the Lord. And what kind of really caps the whole thing off is when God tells him to go destroy the Amalekites, an enemy of the people of God. In fact, God says, destroy them, and meaning everything. Uh, uh, every village, the livestock, the king, the family, every, just get everything. It's, it's clean washed. And he doesn't do it. In fact, he goes and he saves the king alive. He doesn't kill the king of the Amalekites. I think that'd be the first one you'd want to do in this deal, amen? But he doesn't do that, and we don't know the reasons. Maybe it's issues of pride, wanted to kind of strut his stuff around him, or, you know, a trophy, or maybe he knew the guy, was friends on some We just don't know that whole story. But for whatever reason, it was the wrong reason. And then he saves the uh, livestock. The best of the livestock, you know, that's a good-looking cow. You can't kill that cow, you know, that, that's a good-looking heifer. That's a, uh, that's a good-looking steer. But, you know, he uses the guise of uh, later when, it, when, uh, when called on the carpet about it by the prophet. He, oh, I was, that was for an, uh, an offering. We were going to make a sacrifice of that, of that to the Lord. Of course, that was immediately after Samuel said, uh, have you done everything the Lord told you to do? And his response was like, you know, like a lot of Baptists I know. I've done everything God wants me to do. Yeah, I'm obeying God. I've done it. One time. The Lord is pleased with me. And all of a sudden you hear in the background, <laughs> you know, the Chick-fil-A uh, cows back there eat more chicken, sign up, kind of sticks his nose in the middle of everything. And the, the, the sheep are, you know, uh, and the, oh, 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 that. What, Sam, what, what mean this, this lowing of oxen and bleeding of sheep? Oh, that's, uh, well, I was going to give that to God. Certainly the, your, the Lord can use that. And that's that great statement in Scripture. When the prophet looks at the king and says to him, you know, has the Lord as much delight, the Lord has more delight in obedience than in burnt offerings. What Samuel's life was marked, I mean Saul's life was marked with was just kind of going part way with God. Just kind of obeying him in areas, but not really completely. And now his day of grace, perhaps we might call it, is just kind of gone. And it's over, and his reign, in the, as far as God's concerned, is done. Now he's still in office, but you know, God's getting ready to promote someone else in due season, in due time. So here you are in this place where, you know, uh, he's, he's been basically in the mind of God and in the heart of Samuel. He knows what's going on. He's been demoted, all right? There's nothing to look forward to as far as King Saul is concerned. And in chapter 16, it starts off like this after this, this, this whole process is going on. You see a picture of the Samuel the prophet, and he's, he's you know, he's, he's wounded. He's, he's grieving. He's sorrowful because... He's disappointed, and who knows for the depths of this, to what relationship was there, or what expectations Samuel might have had for Saul. Uh, I mean, he's the one who anointed him under the, under the, the, the leadership of the Holy Spirit. So he's, he's defeated and he's hurting. And it says in 1 Samuel 16, verse 1, And the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul, since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go, and I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite. For I have selected a king for myself among his sons. But Samuel said, How can I go? When Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and, and say, I have come to sacrifice the Lord. And you shall invite Jesse to the sacrifice. And I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me the one whom I designate to you. So Samuel did what the Lord said. And he came to Bethlehem. And the elders of the city came trembling to meet him and said, Do you come in peace? And he said, In peace I've come to sacrifice the Lord. Consecrate yourselves. Come with me to the sacrifice. And he also consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. Now it's a time of disappointment, but God's got something he's doing. The program's not over. As they say before, you know, the fat lady hadn't even begun to sing. We're getting down to the point where God's getting ready to show his will and his purposes, but Samuel's not in the mood for it. He's in a place of, of grieving. How long will you grieve over Saul? Now, I don't know when was the last time you had this, this kind of feeling or emotion in your life, but again, as I stated earlier, we all experience this particular type of emotion. And for Samuel, it's, it's a very sorrowful occasion. You know, he, he's, he's, he's seen what God's done, and, and the declaration of God through Samuel to, to King Saul was found in, in chapter 13 when he says, And Samuel said to Saul, You have acted foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God which he commanded you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever, but now your kingdom shall not endure. It's kind of like, if only. 
Don't you see what could have been? Don't you see the greatness that was before you? Don't you see the opportunity that you have just sinned away? Don't you see what God could have done? I think sometimes we, in that same emotion and situation, we thought something was going to go a particular way, and it did, and we said, oh, man, it's over now, or it's not going to work, or whatever comes to our heart and mind. And Satan loves us when we're at this time in our, in our lives, when we go through these kind of experiences. He, he loves to kick dirt in your face, you know, and, and, and make you feel the emotion of sorrow and loss and as deep as you can possibly feel it. But every one of us, We'll go through times in our life, and sometimes it might be a daily deal, it's a very small thing, and sometimes it's when we have these great expectations that just seem to go unmet. And here in the midst of this, it's a genuine, real emotion. God comes to him and says, how long are you going to grieve over Saul? I mean, he, the scripture talks about him being, you know, in exceeding sorrow. That's not what that word grief is, exceeding disappointment. How long? By the way, it is natural and it is normal for when you to have these moments like this in your life. It's, they happen and it's a natural and normal to experience that dissatisfaction. And it can be something as simple as dissatisfaction that pours over into deep grief. I mean, even the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit can be grieved and that we can grieve the Holy Spirit in our life which ought to be the last thing we want to do. We want to honor God and, and we, want to, we want to be living in such a way that gives Him glory and praises Him and demonstrates how valuable and how worthy He is in our life. And we act in ways that can be grieving to the Holy Spirit. We need to be, be trusting God. But again, there's like, it's, it's like there are things that happen and we have no control over them. They happen even as much as we try to control them. We still don't hold the, the steering wheel in most situations of life and they go different directions than what we expected. This is what Ecclesiastes is trying to explain to us and, and Solomon's explaining in Ecclesiastes chapter 1 when he says, To everything there is a season, a time to every purpose under the heaven, a time to be born and a time to die a time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a, a time to break down, a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather up stones, gather them together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to get, a time to lose, to keep, and time to cast away, a time to rend, a time to sow, a time to keep silence, and a time to speak, a time to love, a time to hate, a time of war, a time of peace. In other words, we go through all these experiences in our life, and some of them are satisfactory, and some of them are not so satisfactory, but they're real. So God, I don't believe in this particular instance, is reproving Samuel for what he's experiencing, but he's just saying, you don't need to live there. You don't need to stay there. You grieve, and then you move on. In other words, we all experience grief, every one of us in this room, and if not every one of us, every one of us soon in this room, sooner or later, will experience the deep loss of someone we love and care for deeply in our lives. But what the, what the Word of God is trying to say to us, even though we experience deep grief and sorrow, we cannot let those things cripple us so that we don't personally accomplish the will of God and the purposes of God for our own lives. And at this point, it's kind of like in regard to Saul. I mean, to what point is the weeping at this point? God has decreed something else. God has said, this is the way it's going to go. And no matter how much he cries and no matter how many tears he sheds, they will not prevail in reversing the will of God. And so he's saying to him in this particular situation, how long will you grieve? In other words, it's, it's time at this point to move forward. It's time to make a change. It's time to, to, to see, you know, what I have in store for you. So there is a time for grieving. There is a time for sorrow, but there's also a time for hearing what God says and moving on at that particular point. And I believe this is just a, I believe there's so much here that it's in this little incident in scriptures, God's preparing to anoint David to be king, that's easily overpassed if we just don't hover over these few verses for a moment and see what my, perhaps the Holy Spirit might want to glean for us in our own hearts and lives because every one of us should come to this place. I think there's about five things that I pulled out of here, and we probably could make a sermon series out of it, but we won't. Let's just quickly look at these five things. One, he says, here's what I want you to do. Fill your horn with oil. 
Interesting verse. He says, how long will you agree? Fill your home with oil. I've got something that I want you to do. For us, obviously, it means that we are to be, the whole, oil is always symbolized, symbolizes the Holy Spirit. And I think it, in, in this New Testament sense, it's saying to us, you need to be filled with the Spirit. The only way, obviously, you're going to deal with the, the pain, the difficulty, the crisis, is to experience the presence of God. You need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And we know the Holy Spirit ultimately is the only one who can heal. He's the only one that can satisfy. He strengthens. He, he encourages. And the oil of God is essential in our life. David the psalmist at one point says, oh Lord, anoint me with fresh oil. Now, I praise God that once we do receive Jesus Christ, He becomes our personal Lord and Savior, that we receive the Holy Spirit in our life. And He is that oil. He is that anointing. He is, as the, as the Scripture calls, the balm of Gilead. When there's sorrow, when there's hurt, when there's pain, he's the one who has the, the right application for those times in our life. So it is necessary that not only when there's a task in front of us, but, when, but even when we're experiencing crisis and sorrow and heartbreak and heartache, that we express our heart to God and allow the Holy Spirit to fill our lives. Fill your horn with oil. I have something for you to do. It's essential. And by the way, the oil is always essential. There's no time, any time, ever in your life that you will not need the power of the Holy Spirit if you're going to be what God's called you to be. And so I think he's reminding him as well as sending him on a task that's important, but fill the horn with oil. So the first thing in our, I believe in our situations and times of disappointment is, hey, turn to God and say, I just need you to fill me today. I need you to fill me. The Bible talks about the filling of the Holy Spirit in, 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 in symbolic ways of, of being drunk with wine. Don't be drunk with wine, that's excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. In other words, don't let the world and those elements influence your life, your decisions, you know. It's not, it's not alcohol that's going to resolve your problems. You know, you think you're going to drown them, but you find out you can drink and drink and drink, but problems swim. They've all had swimming lessons. You can't drown them. But what you do need is the presence and the power and the working of the Holy Spirit in your life. So this is that time, not when you run from God, but when you run to God and you allow him to fill you with the Holy Spirit. The second thing I want you to glean from this, he says, listen, you take the horn of oil and I will send you, I will send you. And he talks, I'm going to send you to Bethlehem and he tells him what to do. By the way, the first thing here is that God's trying to, I believe, say to the prophet, I'm not through with you. Yeah, it didn't turn out the way you would have thought or the way you would have liked, you know. Uh, and, and, and I know your expectations were high, but whatever it was, hey, we're not done here. I'm not through the nation. I'm not through with you. I'm still working. I've still got a plan. And all too often, you know, uh, we, we allow ourselves to fall in that deceptive mode of our plan. This is the way I want it to work, and this is the way I will define if it has worked. If it succeeds, it will be because I have in my mind what success is, and one, two, three, four will be just set in place, in time, just right, and if that's the, way it, if that's the end, then I succeeded. God says, you know, that's, that's not, success is not within, uh, for you to define, it's for me to define. But I want you to know, I will send you. It's not over. God is still working in our hearts and our lives. And we can experience some of the greatest disappointments and griefs and sorrows of our life. But if we're still breathing, God's not done with us yet. And we need to realize that so that we don't get to the place where we're just kind of stagnant. And we're, we're, we're not looking to God and expecting anything of God. And there's no faith. And, and, and of course, Samuel says in verse 2, you know, uh, you know how, how can I go? Saul hears of it, will kill me. Now, I, I don't know if he's complaining here or if God's just being a sounding board. And sometimes those two th kind of things can get blended off. We're just kind of sounding off. We're trying to, you know, we, we, when we, God tells us to do something, you know, we're going to look at all the ins out, the negatives, the positives, the, the ups and downs, the insides, the outsides, however we can look at it, figure out what to do. And God just says, hey, I want you to go. Uh, but what about? No, just go. And by the way, you know, you can argue with God all, all day long. And I have discovered... After 30, almost 40 years of being saved and arguing with the Lord on multiple occasions, I have never convinced him to change his mind. I'm pretty good at that, too. I thought, until you try it with God. I mean, I, Kathy's still working through the campus and stuff, so I can I pretty much get my way with her. Keep that to yourself. You know, I, I got a pretty good, you know, pretty good spiel, you know, and... I, you know, I could crack that joke just at the right time. Some of you guys know what I'm talking about, right? Even though you, you know, you let her think she's in control, right? I know, ladies, that's what you were thinking. You were, I'm just thinking. 
Well, you know, we can, we, you can have the best spiel in the world. You can be the best communicator. It doesn't matter. God's mind is set and it's settled. And what you need to do is quit arguing and just do what God says. Now, I don't, I, again, I don't know if he's just sounding off. And I, I think as Bill Stafford said, you know, it's all right to argue with God as long as you conclude, thy will be done. <laughs> you know, that, you know, okay, now I've said my piece. Now I'm going to go do what you want done. But understand that no matter how perfect you think it is in your mind, you want to argue with God about it, God's plans are far higher and far better. And sometimes it's just best to say, thy will be done, Lord. What is your will in this sense? I, I just want what you want. But I do believe any time that there is a call of God to do something in our life or he's leading us somewhere or, or telling us to do something, there's always that element of fear. I mean, it's always the first contestant because anything we do for God always requires that, that step of obedience and faith. And usually the very first contestant to obedience and faith is fear. Oh, what about this and what about that? He just, he just at this point, you know, uh, says, hey, I'm going to do what God wants me to do. Now, it, it is possible that he's asking direction from God on how to manage this, the, manner, the matter of, a, of a King Saul prudently, you know, uh, so as not to uh, expose himself in the situation or perhaps the, the one he's going to be anointing king. But whatever it is, the bottom line is, Go. Whatever the Lord's telling you, quit arguing about it. Whatever the excuse, you, and you can't say, well, Lord, I, I was doing what I thought was the right thing last time, and look how it turned out. Just go. Go. Do what I'm telling you to do. Go and see what God does. Now, the third part of this, I think, was interesting. He says, and, and, and take with you a heifer for sacrifice. Take, take a, I want you to take a sacrifice with you, all right? And by the way, I think we've lost the context of what a sacrifice is. Is. You know, when he tells him to take this sacrifice with him, take the heifer uh, and, and say to them, I've come to sacrifice the Lord. We, we've lost the context of what real sacrifice is. The principle here, obviously, is once I go, be willing to, to pay a price if necessary. Be willing to sacrifice if necessary. Take a heifer with you. I want you to sacrifice to the Lord. Now, understand, we use that word in kind of a, a negative, I'm going to lose something sense. You know, if I take a heifer, that's a good heifer. You know, I just, I, I had that heifer for a reason, not to waste it. That's what some people think about, you know, giving, isn't it? I, that's, my, that's my money, God. And if I gave you that amount of money, that just, uh, you know what I can do with that money? Well, we've seen what you've done with it, all right? So let's, we'll talk about that at another time, all right? Lord, I, it, it, the idea here is that we don't understand that sacrifice, carefully, listen carefully, sacrifice is worship. It's just an, it's an aspect, it's a form of worship, all right? In other words, genuine worship really does cost us. I, I think we even lose that context that we don't even understand it in the simplest form. Perhaps coming in here this morning, all right? You came in and the music starts and what'd you do? Well, Brother Joe, I don't sing so well, so I just kind of listen. Well, the Bible doesn't say if you don't sing so well, just listen. And so literally for you to open up your mouth and sing becomes... A sacrifice. It maybe you have to sing some bad. You have to, it's a sacrifice of humility. You know, Amen. Bible doesn't say you know to make a joyful note unto the Lord. All right, make a joyful what? Noise unto the Lord. And for you to come into a worship service, which is a place of corporate worship, and not to worship, well, that's just sin. I mean, that's, you know, maybe we need to give an altar call right now, first of all, so you can confess your sin and get it out of the way. It's just sin. Well, Brother Joe, I just not the way I worship. The Bible says, offer the sacrifice of the calves, these calves, not the heifer, these calves, the calves of your lips unto the Lord, that you open your mouth, you honor God, and we come together in corporate worship, and it literally means you're willing to sacrifice. Some of you, it was a sacrifice of the way you felt. You didn't feel like singing, but you put that on the altar, and you sang. Are, are you with me on this? Say, uh-huh. All right. Some of you, was a, you know, a mindset of you, you're not a singer, you know. Put that on the altar. The Lord says, make a joy. The Lord says, sing unto the Lord a new song. Over and over and over through Scripture, we are commanded as the saints of God to sing unto the Lord and to rejoice and to worship and to lift melodies to Him and to honor Him in that particular way. He's blessed by it. We're blessed by it. But yes, it does require a sacrifice. As simple as it is. As little as that, and that's a little sacrifice. But what about the bigger times? I mean, there's going to be times you don't learn stuff in the molehills. What are you going to do when the mountains come? I mean, one, one of the scriptures say, if you can't run with the foot soldiers, what are you going to do when the horsemen get here? I mean, if you can't run with the foot soldiers by singing, you know, how great thou art, what are you going to do when you face the bigger crisis in your life, the difficulties of life? It's going to be hard, is it not? 
So he's saying here, you know, I want you to take a heifer, be, will, be willing to make a sacrifice. In fact, everything about our life really focuses in and around on this. And even the scripture tells us this is our life. I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy sacrifice, acceptable to God. That's your spiritual service of worship. Don't be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the will of God and that which is good and acceptable and that which is perfect. I really don't believe we see that which is good and acceptable and perfect without making commitments to the Lord and sacrifices to the Lord. And it really does start out in the beginning of our day. When we start a morning, we say, Lord, this body belongs to you. I put it on the altar. And again, it's not loss. It's gain. It's gain. And whether it's singing a song, whether it's preventing my life, presenting my tithes, whatever it might be, it's gain. It's always gain. You never outgive God. So you see, the beauty of this sacrifice is that it kicks something into gear, basically. It kicks that interaction between you and your Heavenly Father, the, the, the experience of personal relationship, the experience of fellowship, because you're interacting now in faith. You're trusting. You're believing. How long are you going to stand there? How long are you going to sit there? Hey, it's fill your horn with oil, and you go do what I've told you to do, and be prepared to make sacrifice, wherever that sacrifice might be, because, hey, you're going to see the glory of God in this situation. The fourth thing he says, and by the way, I want you to invite Jesse. And I just kind of put a little slash up there for Jesus. It is similar. But you know the word Jesse, what it means in Hebrew language? It means wealthy or I possess. Now, here's the thing about it. I need to invite the Lord because I don't possess what I need. He does. He is Jehovah Jireh. He's the only one who possesses all things. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So no matter what I need in my life that I do not have, he has. So I really believe this is kind of two things are involved here. One would be Jesus or the Father. However you want to say this, you invite God to this situation. Whatever God's called you to do, you make sure he's involved and that he is a part of it. Because if you miss out on him in this situation, you're missing out on the strength, the grace, the power that you're going to need. What did Paul the Apostle say? My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. In other words, the source of everything I need is him, so I need to invite him. Yeah. And you say, that, that's kind of silly. Well, let me share it with you this way. Some of you are familiar with the name F.B. Meyer, great theologian. F.B. Meyer was uh, riding on a train one day, and there was a lady sitting there by who recognized who, who he was, and she decided she would just kind of share her burden with him. And for years, she, had been, uh, she, she was a mom of a crippled daughter who'd kind of grown up and uh, was, just re was the joy of her life. And every morning, uh, she would get up and she would make tea for her daughter and they would sit and chat about the morning. And then she would leave for work and excited knowing that when she came home in the evening, her daughter would be there to greet her when she arrived home. She's the only one left in the family and in her life. But then one day, death entered their household. The daughter passed away. And the grieving mother was left alone and just living not just in grief, but in deep misery. And she was explaining this to Dr. Meyer. She says, you know, my home, just not home anymore. And listen to the counsel that F.B. Meyer gave her. He said, here's what I want you to do, ma'am. He said, when you get home today, you put that key in the door. And when you open the door, you say in a loud voice, Jesus, I know you are here. He says, as you get into the home and you put down things, you begin to talk with you. As you light your fire in the evening, you begin to tell Jesus. If somebody's been nice to you today, tell Jesus. If somebody's been unkind to you today, tell Jesus about it. Just as if you would tell your daughter the experiences of the day, I want you to take time and reach out and tell the Lord Jesus. Just speak to him loudly and openly as you would your daughter. And when nighttime falls at your home, when you lay down on your bed at night, I want you to stretch out your hand in the darkness and say, Jesus, I know you are here. Some months later, F.B. Meyer was in that community again and in that neighborhood, and he met that woman again. Even though he didn't recognize her, she came up to him. He said, and her face was just filled with radiance and joy instead of this announcing misery that he'd seen before. She said, Dr. Meyer, I did what you told me. And it's made all the difference in my life. And now, I not only know he's there, I just feel him when he's there. Yeah. And it's it's, it's the, the principle of get God in on the situation. Invite the Lord to your disappointment. You know, we talk about throwing a pity party and nobody shows up. Instead, throw a praise party and watch God show up. 
and trust him in these situations. First of all, it has to do with Jesus, but he also invited the elders and he invited Jesse and he invited sons. And I think the second part about this invitation is that we invite others as well. That's not going for me. You'll have to hit it there. We invite others. That should be one more slot on that. Go back. Back, the other way. That back. Yeah, that Aggie back. There you go. <laughs> First of all, it's the Lord, and second of all, it's others. It's others. God made us as interrelational beings. And when you were at the couple's retreat, you might have, if you were there, when I talked about when God created man and the whole creation process, he made them, he said, God created man twice, he says this. And God created man and he created him male and female. In other words, God created man for relationships. And God didn't create us to live in isolation. And isn't it the first thing we usually do when we've been hurt or disappointed or sorry? We kind of close the doors to everybody. We just kind of, you know, that, that turtle methodology. We kind of pull into our own shell and we kind of do business right there with ourselves. And, and we just kind of exclude everybody else. He said, you will anoint for me, you know, uh, uh, who I tell you. But when you go, you invite Jesse. And he did. And you invite his sons. If you find yourself cutting people off, that's the wrong direction. You're not headed in the right direction. You're, you have a relationship with Jesus, but it's not so personal that you're just to live it for yourself. In fact, I've told you before, I'm not excited about that terminology we've come so acquainted with and so familiar with about I have a personal relationship with Jesus. Yes, we do, and it's genuine, and it's real, and it's between me and Him. But it doesn't stop there, all right? It's not personal to the point that it excludes. It's personal so that it includes. And we're living in a culture where people say, well, it's, you know, i got a relationship with God, but that's my thing, and it's a personal relationship. It's between me and Jesus. It's kind of like so everybody else can just go to the devil. No. We are salt. We are light. We're here to live it out. The Bible calls us to be part of a great body, the body of Christ, where we have gifts, where relationships are established and fellowship happens. We have a commonality. We have a, a common Savior, a common God, a common faith, a common truth. We have light and life, and it's not to be lived in a shell. It's to be experienced and expressed, so it requires a sacrifice of our pride and our selfishness. And so what we have to do, especially in times like this, we have to let those barriers down, and we have to make willful decisions to step outside of ourselves, not only to reach out to receive ministry, but at the same time to give ministry. The Bible says we can comfort one another with the comfort that we've been comforted with. This is exactly what I believe is happening and what the express purpose of this is all about. There's, there's, you've got to move out. Get involved in the will of God, and the will of God always involves other people. And last, and we'll close with this, you have to only look to God for answers in this situation. The Lord says, you know, you're going to anoint for me the one whom I, I designate to you. And Samuel did what the Lord said, and he came to Bethlehem. Now, here's the deal. Here's what I want you to do. But he didn't tell him everything right there. He said, I want you to go do this. But what are we going to do? I, I, you know, well, I'm going to let you go talk to Jesse, and then you, and, and you'll do, but you're not going to know until you get there. Well, why don't you tell me now? Wouldn't it be easier if you just tell me now? We cut the chase, get to the bottom line. There's a lot of times we just don't know the end. And a lot of times it just calls us to look to God and only God for the answers. And say, God, I'm just going to trust you. And sure enough, in this process of anointing, he starts to anoint Eliab. I mean, hey man, he's the next best looking guy in town. Saul is number one, Eliab is number two. He's a big man, broad shoulders. He has all the looks of a king, looks like he might fill, fit the bill. And God says, I'm not interested in him. For I'm not looking on the outward man. I look on the inward man and the heart of a man. You look on the outward man, you're going to anoint somebody like Saul again. By the way, Saul was called the people's prince. Now we're finding God's prince. We're finding out who God wants to bring to this place and who from this particular man, whom God anoints to be king, comes the great king of kings, the Lord and Savior in physical human form, the son of David. Listen, you can't sit there and trust your own mind to come up to the right conclusion. You keep asking God. You keep looking to God. Not only have I invited God to this situation, I'm going to keep listening to Him, and I'm going to keep looking for Him. Hey, I'm going to trust whatever He wants to say and whatever He wants to do. Because things don't always... I may get out there in the middle of this situation and be disappointed again because He was. He's getting ready to know Eliab. Because, oh, 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 hold on. Oh, I, I like Eliab. He's not the one. Well, when I saw him, my expectations were, hey, he's the guy. He's not the one. Well, here he is. He's left one disappointment to another one. But what do we say about disappointments? When we understand them, they become his appointments. So that we can take time to hear, what, okay, God, then who are you wanting to anoint? Or you can just say, I just don't want to play ball anymore. This way you're going to treat me, God. No, what do you got any no friends? 
You can play that game. There's nothing to be gained eternally. And there's certainly nothing to be gained in your own life because God may be trying to work out a deeper value and understanding in your life and greater maturity in your life. And it's a hard thing because, hey, most of the time my first, depend, my first deal is, I just going to pout a little bit. And yours too, so don't look at me like that. You're going to pout a little bit. I mean, it's just human nature. We, you know, we're going to pout. God's doing something deep. Look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. What a great illustration. Here they were, taken from their homes and taken into Babylonian captivity, and they're just committed to do whatever God says, even if they lose their life, and they stay the course. And boy, what happens? God begins just to elevate them. All right? You know, got me elevated. And now the rulers, we call them the three Hebrew children. Hey, they're, they're children of the Hebrews, but they're men. And they're grown men. And now they're ruling over provinces in Babylon. Hey, things couldn't get been. Hey, we could be king before this is over with. We got a good deal going here until, you know, the king has a dream, wants to build this big statue, and then he wants everybody to bow to it. Hold on. I don't know. I, I can imagine that when they hear this news about this statue and this image and all that's going on, remember, this is not Grimm's fairy tales. These are real men. And all of a sudden, hey, this is, think, this is not going the way it's supposed to go. This is going to really mess up my career. How am I going to feed my children? And what good am I to God if I'm dead? I love what they said, because they looked at the Lord and said, when the king said, gave them this opportunity, a second opportunity to, to backslide, they said, we don't care what you do. We know what we're going to do. We're going to serve God. Basically, saying, our expectations are in the Lord. And if you kill us, we go up and smoke, it'll be holy smoke. You know? But the, the, the common mindset is we won't bend, we won't bow, we won't burn. They didn't know that for sure at this point, did they? They went into that fire, what, thrown into that fire, thinking it's all over probably. But because they had invited God in the scene and were looking to God and their expectations were from above, it's amazing what God did. Maybe they thought that they would have such influence prior to the fire, that we could have such influence because we've come so far, we can certainly influence the king one day to become, you know, a believer at least in, in, in word to make a national difference. Now, how's that going to happen if we're dead? They had their plan, but God had his plan. When Nebuchadnezzar looked into the fire and he saw them in the fiery furnace, he said, come out Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And then he made this decree. Anybody who doesn't worship the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego will be turned into a dung heap. Y'all know what a dung heap is, don't you? All right, pile of poo. That's as simple as I can put it. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's, I, I don't look at me. King said it, all right? He quoted it, you know, he wrote it, I'm just quoting it. But that's, that's what it is, a dung heap. I mean, in an instant, in one fiery instant, more progress was made than Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego living 120 years doing what they were doing. It could well be that we don't realize the advances that can come through our own difficulties and our own crises and our own sorrows if we take the time to hear what God is saying and what God is doing and what God wants to do in our hearts and life. We have to be looking to God. We'll be disappointed. Joseph and his brothers, uh, they were thrown, threw him in the pit, ended up in prison, did a jail sentence, later becomes second ruler in Egypt, and his brothers come in, and when upon realizing him, they're broken and repent. He said, hey, what you intended for evil, or even what the devil intended for evil, God intends for good. That's that same principle and from Romans where he says all things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose. It doesn't say all things are good, are they? There's a lot of stuff that's bad. I've had a lot of bad stuff happen around me, haven't you? A lot of bad problems, a lot of difficulties, a lot of hurts, a lot of pains, a lot, a lots of disappointments. But they certainly are genuine disappointments if they don't become his appointments where he can work and where he can move and where he can minister in our life. Samuel's disappointed. Maybe he somehow feels, at one point, even responsible. But that's not where he's supposed to stay. How long are you going to stay there? Fill your horn. Be filled with the Spirit. Let God touch your life. Let God bring His balm. Let God bring His, his touch. Let God bring His healing. Let God bring His encouragement in the midst of your discouragement. Allow the Holy Spirit. But you can't do it if you're looking the wrong direction. 
Welcome the Holy Spirit. Fill your home with oil. Be willing to be obedient to whatever He says to do, even if it involves a sacrifice in your heart and in your life on some level that maybe you're not even wanting to do. You make the sacrifice. You invite God into the situation. You involve others in the situation. You find people who will stand with you and pray with you and believe God with you. You make a difference not only in your life. They make a difference in your life. You make a difference in their life. If you minister to people, by the way, in any kind of capacity, you know what's going to happen? You're going to be disappointed, and you'll disappoint others. I mean, I just preached this sermon this morning. I drove away from that campus over Magnolia. About 15 minutes after I left that campus, I realized I hadn't done something I told somebody I would do, and I know it was a tremendous disappointment to them. And you talk about feeling like a royal jerk in that moment. I felt about that big. I just preached on disappointment, so I'm glad they were ready for it. <laughs> because I certainly disappointed them. I told them I'd do something and just forgot to do it. In the rush and all the stuff going, there was no excuse in my regard, you know. This kind of stuff I'd chew Brother Tim out for, you know. And I'd let him chew me out for, all right. Just, you know, just no excuse for it. Especially, it was, it, it was, I've resolved it since then and now, all right. It's probably a bigger disappointment to me than it was them. Just knowing that, you know, you didn't do something you said you'd do. But it comes. Those things happen. And it's how we respond and what we do with them. And do we, do we really believe that all things work together and that God's going to be glorified through it all? Then we have to trust Him. So I would say today, whatever you're kind of maybe sitting on, like Samuel, turn it up to Him. Put it on the altar. Ask Him to feed with those Holy Spirit. Ask Him to give you divine insight, wisdom, direction, a word. Then move forward in it. Would you stand with your heads bowed today?